Number 10. SS Thistlegorm Just a year after being built in 1940 and after completing only three successful voyages, the British merchant navy ship SS Thistlegorm was attacked by German bombers in the Red Sea. The ship was a little longer than an American football field at 420 feet. She spent much of her short-lived career transporting steel rails, aircraft parts, grain, and rum between Europe, Argentina, and the West Indies. In 1941, she embarked on her final voyage from Glasgow, Scotland to Alexandria, Egypt, filled with motorcycles, trucks, guns, ammo, radio equipment, aircraft parts, and two locomotives. When the Thistlegorm reached the Suez Canal, there was an accident blocking the passage. With few other options, the captain docked the vessel off the Egyptian coast. Suspecting that the Allies were trying to enter Egypt, the Nazis dispatched a pair of bombers with orders to find and destroy the ship. Two bombs struck the Thistlegorm, causing some of the ammunition on board to explode. Nine people died in the attack. French explorer Jacques Cousteau discovered the wreck during the 1950s, but it was soon forgotten about. The coastal city of Sharm el-Sheikh opened the wreck to divers in the early 1990s. Visitors can access the ship's interior through an opening that was created during the bombing. Most of the cargo still remains inside. The Thistlegorm ranks among the world's favorite wreck dives. It sits roughly 100 feet beneath the surface, where some advanced diving skills are required, but the water is shallow enough not to need any special equipment. Number 9. SS Kingston Built in 1871, the SS Kingston was a British steam-powered cargo ship that could also carry passengers. While carrying 70 tons of coal from London to Aden a decade later, the vessel ran aground in shallow waters along the Shag Rock coral reef off the coast of Egypt. It was traveling at maximum speed when it crashed. For two days, the crew tried to keep the ship afloat with no success, and the Kingston sank beneath the waves. Thankfully, there were no casualties in the unfortunate wreck. Shipping traffic between Britain and India was increasing by the day. Steamships were becoming more popular and could navigate in challenging conditions that earlier vessels were more vulnerable to, like heavy winds and strong currents. But they needed coal in order to run, making it important for ports along the Suez to be fully stocked so they could accommodate the growing traffic. Over 140 years later, the Kingston wreck still sits upright in the same position it came to rest in after its crew failed to save it. Much of the ship has deteriorated. Parts of it remain impressively intact for its age and function as an artificial coral reef. Its propeller and much of its machinery are still identifiable, even beneath the layers of hard and soft coral. Situated just 33 to 66 feet underwater, the Kingston is a popular dive site among scuba divers of all skill levels. Number 8. SS Rosalie Mahler Two days after the Germans sunk the British merchant navy ship SS Thistlegorm in the Red Sea in 1941, they shot down its sister ship SS Rosalie Mahler. Built in 1910, the Scottish-built vessel was repurposed in 1938 by the Royal Navy for service in the British war effort as an armored cargo ship. Its primary job was to transport coal to forces stationed in Egypt. To get around the Suez Canal, which was heavily guarded by the Nazis, Rosalie Mahler went around Africa and entered the Red Sea via the Gulf of Aden. It was spotted and struck by German bombers. The ship came to rest upright 164 feet below the waves near what is now Ras Muhammad National Park. That's about half as deep as the Statue of Liberty is tall. Because of how deep it is, the wreck has been protected from mass dives, leaving it in remarkably intact condition. Over the years, the hull became blanketed with hard and soft coral, turning it into a thriving artificial reef. It also attracts a variety of marine species, including reef sharks, tuna, scorpionfish, moray eels, and more. Number 7. MV Salem Express The MV Salem Express was a roll-on, roll-off passenger ferry that experienced a series of unfortunate events starting just months after it was launched in 1966. It got into its first collision in 1967. Three years after that, a fire broke out. A decade later, in 1980, it ran aground. On another occasion, the ship caused a traffic jam because of its slow operations. But the vessel's worst mishap came in late 1991 while sailing from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia to Safaga, Egypt. After being delayed for two days because of mechanical issues, the Salem Express finally departed from Saudi Arabia during a heavy storm. The captain deviated from its planned route, taking an unauthorized shortcut, and the decision proved disastrous when the ship ran aground on a coral reef just miles from the Egyptian shore. The ship's bow door was ripped open and seawater flooded into the car deck. It took just 20 minutes for the ferry to sink with hundreds of passengers trapped on board. The exact number of deaths is unknown because of conflicting news reports and claims, but it's known that there were around 180 survivors. While the official report claims that there were 644 passengers total, other sources have put the number as high as 850. The Salem Express is a controversial dive site. Passengers' personal items still scatter the interior and the surrounding seafloor. 
To respect the lives lost, the wreck's internal passageways have been sealed off to visitors. While many divers adhere to a policy of not touching anything, others have rummaged through items and even kept souvenirs, proving why not everyone approves of people visiting the site. Number 6. Ancient Landslide During a deep dive in the Gulf of Aqaba and the Northern Red Sea, geoscientist Sam Perkis and other scientists noticed an alarming break in the seabed 3,000 feet below the waves. That's a distance about two and a half times as tall as the Empire State Building. Suspecting that this was more than a simple wreck, they had the pilot turn around. It was then that the scientists observed a 15-foot-high groove stretching across the sea floor. Perkis could tell that a tremendous geological force had caused the massive break. In a recent study, his team concluded that an underwater landslide happened around 500 years ago, followed by a catastrophic tsunami. Perkis said the seabed moved, causing part of a reef slope to drop several meters and get stuck beneath the large quantity of rock that hangs over it. These findings warn of the possibility of another underwater landslide, which would trigger another tsunami. If the rock wall Sam Perkis discovered collapsed, the ensuing tsunami would be much bigger than the one that happened centuries ago. Based on computer simulations, the ancient landslide may have produced a 30-foot-high tsunami wave, which would have been extremely deadly. That's as high as a school bus is long. The coastline is more populated now than it was 500 years ago, and an even bigger wave would undoubtedly lead to a devastating disaster. The effects could destroy bustling coastal towns in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Israel. None of these countries have an effective enough early warning system for earthquakes and tsunamis, but Perkis recommended developing them. He said that a lot of movement happens in the region and that it wouldn't take much to collapse the wall. Have you ever experienced an earthquake? Tell us about it in the comments and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Number 5. Ancient Migration Route When migrants traveled from Africa to Arabia around 5,000 years ago, they may have taken a now-submerged route along the Red Sea coast while living off marine mollusks, according to a statement from the University of York. Until recent years, researchers believed that the drought conditions along this route would have inhibited the movement of hunter-gatherers. But a study published in 2020 revealed that researchers had found thousands of mollusk shells in Saudi Arabia's Farasan Islands, suggesting that they may have been a food source for ancient people. The resources necessary to make an arduous trek across an unforgiving environment were available, even during periods of little rainfall and a decreased food supply. The shells, which were submerged when sea levels rose after the last ice age, were abundant enough to continuously feed populations as they passed through. Besides sustaining migrant groups, mollusks likely fed coastal communities that settled along the Red Sea shoreline. Another important finding shows that while people ate mollusks in sizable amounts, they didn't deplete them. Their population remained healthy enough to feed future generations of settlers and travelers. The shells that the researchers found were in reefs dating back over 100,000 years clarifying that the region's history of human movement may be more extensive than previously thought. Number 4. SS Carnatic In the northern Red Sea, northwest of Egypt's Shadwan Island, there's a coral reef called Shab Abu Nuhas. Near the entrance of a shipping channel that leads to the Suez Canal, it's home to at least five sunken ships. Included among them is the British steamship SS Carnatic, which ran aground in 1869, making it the region's oldest wreck. Built in the early 1860s, it regularly sailed from Suez to Bombay in the years before the Suez Canal opened up. After it crashed into the coral reef, passengers repeatedly urged the captain to let them abandon the ship. He denied these requests, reassuring his panicked passengers that the Carnatic was safe and that they would soon be rescued by a ship that was due to pass. People grew increasingly worried as the hours passed and the vessel filled with water, causing it to lose power. Finally, the captain ordered everyone to abandon the ship, but only four passengers made it onto a lifeboat before the Carnatic ripped in half, claiming 31 lives. Weeks later, the ship's cargo of gold was salvaged. Rumors of remaining treasure persisted until the wreck's rediscovery in 1984. The Carnatic is possibly the Red Sea's oldest wreck and also one of many divers' favorite destinations. The wreck itself lies on her port side and is relatively safe for divers of all experience levels to explore. There are many spaces in its hole where divers can look inside and see several cracked wine bottles and other remarkable objects, still unharmed after decades underwater. The wooden deck of the Carnatic has vanished over the years and lets plenty of light into the spooky iron-ribbed bowels. Number 3. SS Umbria Built in 1912 in Hamburg, Germany, SS Umbria was a cargo vessel that traveled between Argentina and Europe until Italy purchased it in 1934. In 1940, the ship passed through Egypt's Port Said with a massive weapons supply, including 6,000 tons of bombs, 600 detonators, 100 tons of different weapons, and more. Italy still technically maintained a neutral position in the intensifying war, so the British allowed it to continue along its journey. Just days later, British warships stopped Umbria near the port of Sudan to search it for weapons. 
they had just heard that Italy had officially joined the war to support Nazi Germany. The ship's captain, Lorenzo Muisan, requested permission from British guards to carry out a muster drill. Instead, they scuttled the ship, which came to rest on its port side at a depth of 125 feet. The crew did this to prevent Umbria's goods from falling into British hands and to prevent them from learning anything about Italy's activities. Although the wreck was salvageable, it was left alone because its cargo was deemed dangerous. In the decades since, the sunken ship has become covered in colorful corals and functions as an artificial reef and a home to various fish species. It's in remarkably well-preserved condition and is one of the world's most beautiful wreck dives. Number 2. Ada 2 Wreck the cargo ship Ada II was built in France in 1911 to supply Egyptian lighthouses and buoys. It was on its way to deliver supplies and lighthouse workers to the Coast Guard on Egypt's Big Brother Island in 1957 when a heavy storm hit. While approaching the island, strong winds and high waves pushed the vessel into some rocks. It immediately began to sink. Luckily, a tugboat came by and rescued all 77 people aboard before the Ada drifted toward the island's northwestern tip and sank. The storm and the force of the collision caused the bow to burst as the 246-foot-long ship came to rest on a steep incline, leaving it sitting at depths between 82 and 230 feet. In the years since going down, the wreck has been taken over by coral and is home to many fish species and other creatures. The ship itself may not be that interesting, but the coral and sea life that surround it are a spectacular sight. Because of Ada's depth, it remains inaccessible to most tourists and has therefore remained protected from damage by mass dives. Because of how deep the ship is, along with strong currents, dives at the Ada are recommended only for skilled recreational and technical divers. Number 1. SS Numidia Built in 1901 in Glasgow, Scotland, the 452-foot-long British cargo ship SS Numidia was considered an extremely large vessel for its time. Its maiden voyage went by uneventfully as it traveled from Calcutta and through the Suez Canal back to England, where it was loaded with rails and wheels for Indian railways. During the voyage, Captain John Craig decided to get some sleep shortly after spotting the beacon of Egypt's Big Brother Island. He left his second-in-command in control of Numidia while he retreated to his cabin. A few hours later, around 2 o'clock in the morning, Captain Craig was shaken awake by what he felt like was a powerful blow to the ship. He rushed up to the bridge and found out that the vessel had run aground on a reef. Nobody ever determined the exact cause of the accident, but it was speculated that the second mate had fallen asleep. Several attempts were made to tow the ship out, but to no avail. The crew evacuated to Big Brother Island while the cargo was transferred to other ships. Several weeks later, the Numidia broke in half and came to rest at an extreme angle on the seafloor. At its shallowest, it sits about 33 feet below the surface, where divers can easily explore the remains of both the wreck and some cargo that couldn't be saved. The propeller sits at 262 feet deep and is only accessible to more experienced divers. Number 8. Abandoned Vehicles in Germany In northern Germany, a privately owned automobile and aviation museum, known as the Motor Technica Museum, was a hit for vehicle lovers who wanted to see vintage cars, airplanes, and motorcycles. But the museum also had a secret area with other abandoned vehicles from the former Eastern Bloc left to rust in the open air. It was first opened in 1973 and was a success until 2007 when the owners wanted to renovate the buildings. Sadly, the plan fell through and the museum continued to deteriorate as more delays kept the owners from reopening. Over a hundred old tanks and other military vehicles sat outside the main museum, which at one time had over 3,000 exhibits, both inside and outside. With over a million visitors every year, it was one of the biggest privately owned museums in Europe. It's a bit of a shock to see once mighty helicopters and old rail vehicles rotting and scattered across the grounds. But inside, modern vehicles, including a Concorde aircraft donated from Air France, a vintage Mercedes, and even vintage Rolls Royce from the 1930s, are on display. The sight drew visitors to the rows of decaying trucks, helicopters, and buses kept behind razor wire fencing. It's rare to see so many old military vehicles at one place, and to see them covered in thorny vines and overcome by tall weeds make them even more haunting. Number 7. The Train Graveyard, Bolivia In the middle of the Bolivian desert, the rusted remains of the area's collapsed mining industry have become a haven for travelers. But they aren't just there to see the old locomotives. Visitors come for the spectacle of the location, the world's largest salt flat. It might seem like a strange place to keep the trains, but at one time, the area was bustling with activity. A British company originally built a railway system in the South American town of Uyuni in the late 1880s to connect the country to Pacific ports. Minerals from nearby mines traveled through distribution depots in the town, 
sending tin and other materials for use during the World Wars. But once the wars ended, the mining industry collapsed and the company abandoned the trains. The location where the rusted trains now sit is stunning, with an area bigger than the U.S. state of Delaware. They're so massive that from space, the Uyuni Salt Flats look like a sprawling snow-covered plain in the middle of the desert. Where local prehistoric lakes dried up, they left the flat white surface behind. And if you're there after a storm, you might see an optical illusion while visiting. During the rainy season, the flats look like a massive mirror reflecting the brilliant blue sky overhead. After the mining industry collapsed, local authorities built a hotel on the salt flats to drive tourism. It might not have been the best idea, though. The walls, made entirely from salt blocks, once lasted 12 years before the hotel was closed for being unsanitary. Authorities opened another hotel in 2007, and it seems to be going strong. After a day trip out to see the abandoned trains, guests can relax in the sauna or steam room. Just don't lick the walls. The hotel considers that a big no-no. Number 6. Hebron Outpost, Canada On the Canadian island of Newfoundland, a deserted German outpost sits close to the Labrador Sea. For almost 70 years, the site was a refuge that served as a missionary outpost where the indigenous people of the Arctic, known as the Inuit, lived. Hebron Mission had multiple missionary buildings, a church, and a store, all built with a Germanic style that featured steep, elongated roofs and small dormer windows. Residents were forced to deal with the harsh conditions of the Labrador Sea, where winds lashed the landscape and waves battled the coast. It took its toll on the buildings so that only a few of the original structures remain. A group called the Church of the Brethren, German-speaking Protestants known as Moravians, whose origins trace back to the Czech Republic, constructed the mission buildings. The leader of the group was a professor in philosophy named John Huss, who spoke out against the Roman Catholic Church, and they eventually burned him at the stake for being a heretic. The church first traveled to North America in the 1700s, but it wasn't until after World War II that they made a new home in Newfoundland. They might not have realized the treacherous conditions on the east coast of Canada. Today, some remnants offer a glimpse into the life for the missionaries, including two cemeteries that had a bit of a curious tradition. Instead of burying families together, they buried men with men and women with women. You can see a stark reminder of the harsh conditions faced on the island on the headstones. Most of them belong to people who died in their mid-50s, with a lot of younger women who died in their 20s, as well as some who died during the Great Spanish Flu epidemic in 1918. Stone arrowheads unearthed at the site show that before the Moravians, natives traded in the area for at least 500 years. Even with its remote location, these remnants of the past show how the Canadian province was once home to very different people whose legacies remain to remind us of their stories. Number 5. La Palica Castle, Poland In the middle of the Polish countryside, a massive mansion has been rotting for two decades. One look at La Palica Castle near the tiny village of Kartuzi, and you might think someone built it hundreds of years ago. But the owner started construction in 1979, and he never finished it. He left behind a crumbling, half-finished skeleton that towers over Lake Rikawo. The building was the controversial idea of a local artist named Pior Kazmierczyk, who got permission to build a small studio to work in. But the artist took his idea from an ideal workspace and ran with it. When the castle was finally revealed, local council members were stunned to see what Kazmierczyk started. He eventually ran out of funds, leaving the half-finished structure to crumble as it sat empty. Kazmierczyk's design was inspired by another castle in another small Polish village. The artist included 365 windows in the castle's design to represent the number of days in a year. He also created a beautiful garden, 12 observation towers to represent the number of apostles in the Bible, and 52 chambers to represent the number of weeks in a year. But all the time and energy had now gone to waste, with the building falling into disrepair. It has also become a bit of a haven for urban explorers who leave their mark by tagging the walls with spray paint and other artwork. There were talks of a revival, but the project fell through after no one could afford the hefty price tag for the property and its vast castle. Soon after, the council ordered Kazmierczyk to demolish the castle he worked so hard to build, but it's still decaying in the countryside as a reminder of one man's vision and how it changed the landscape of a quiet Polish village. What do you think should be done with the castle? Let me know in the comments, and remember to hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Number 4. Kennecott Mines, Alaska In 1900, 
prospectors at a remote Alaska glacier stumbled across a deposit of copper ore that would completely change their lives. Word quickly spread about the discovery, and soon, an entire mill town grew from the initial base camp. It became known as the Kennecott Mines. For 30 years, workers mined the area, stripping the land of all the ore deposits they can find. But the moment the riches dried up, the town did too. It would be decades before the Alaskan tourism market saw the new potential for the site. After doing some preservation work, they opened to the public. But they also kept some of the original buildings the way they were, so visitors can get an idea of what life was like for the miners who worked there. Ruins of the mines sat high above the town below, with breathtaking views of the mountains, a stark contrast in the dilapidated mills left to rot. Old platforms had collapsed, and equipment collected dust and debris after years of neglect. Wandering the area, you can almost imagine the way life used to be there. Walking through the empty structures has an eerie feeling, where the ghosts of the old mine are just a memory of how it once thrived. Seeing so many buildings fall into disrepair is a shocking reminder of the prosperity of Kennecott Mines, and how they were so easily abandoned. It was a sad end to a once prosperous camp, one whose remains are a reminder of how fragile natural sites can be. Now that Alaska lists the Kennecott Mines as a National Historic Site, the area will be around for generations to learn about its history. Number 3. Lake Reshin Bell Tower If you're ever traveling through the South Tyrol area of Italy, it might alarm you if you spot a ghostly bell tower emerging from the middle of Lake Reshin. It isn't a figment of your imagination, though. It's a very real structure that once belonged to a tiny village that was purposefully flooded in 1950. The flood wiped out the town at the foot of the Vallelunga Mountains. Before city planners flooded it, the village of Curon was home to hundreds of people who lived and worked there. They spent their time in the church whose steeple remains. In the Alpine regions, bordering Austria and Switzerland, Curon seemed like the perfect place to live until local planners joined the lake with two other nearby to create a hydroelectric dam. Even though residents didn't want to leave their beloved town, there was no stopping construction and as soon as they evacuated all the villagers, they flooded the houses and all the surrounding land, leaving only the haunting bell tower as a reminder that once a bustling little town was where the massive lake now stood. For decades, the town lay submerged, but in 2021, the hydro dam needed repairs, and the only way to get them done was to drain the lake. As the water receded, it revealed steps, cellars, and stone walls from the old town, allowing some of the old residents who had settled in a new village nearby to see what is left of their old lives. Before they drained it, visitors could only get to the 14th century church tower by walking on the ice. When the lake froze over, even if it was only temporary, draining the lake revealed Curon once again. It gave the residents one last chance to say goodbye to the place they so dearly loved. Number 2. Cape Aniva Lighthouse Off the coast of Russia, a haunting beacon sits on the end of Cape Aniva, a nine-story lighthouse built by the Japanese in 1936. What started as a practical construction to keep ships from crashing into the rocky shores of the 590-mile-long Cape became a source of conflict between the Russians and the Japanese, who each wanted control of the strategic location. The Russians wanted to use the land as a penal colony, but the Japanese refused and ended up spending years building up military forces in the area to take control. Eventually, the two nations called a truce and agreed to split the land across the 50th parallel. They also added a ring of smaller lighthouses along the coast to signal nearby passing carriers and merchant ships. But the truce didn't last long, 50 years after signing the agreement. Russia changed its mind when World War II struck, and they kicked out a half a million Japanese who had settled on the island. The bickering continued over the smaller surrounding islands, but even after all the effort and infighting, the lighthouse didn't last. After it became fully automated, there was no need for a lighthouse keeper or crew to live there. And when the nuclear source that powered the lighthouse was depleted, the structure was abandoned. Time and the elements took a toll on the lighthouse after that, with rain rusting the structure and ocean water stripping away its facade and exposing the old radio and equipment rooms. Seagulls have completely taken over the island, with thousands reclaiming the cape and making it their home, and maybe even bringing back a bit of peace to the picturesque location overlooking the bay. And number one, Balestrino Castle. If you're afraid of ghosts, you might not want to live at the bottom of the hill in Liguria, Italy. Just above the village, an abandoned town named Balestrino lingers in a haze of mystery and intrigue. That hasn't stopped visitors from flocking to the area to glimpse the ancient town. 
Some believe it was first settled in the 11th century, but even this is only a guess. We might find a clue to its origins and its age in the old Byzantine castle of Del Corredo. It sits prominently in the little village, but it isn't the first castle built there. A family of nobles from Piedmont built the original structure. They lived there until the 16th century, when another family, known as the Del Corretos, built their castle on the land. Sadly, the building suffered a devastating fire, killing the lord in 1561 and throwing the area into upheaval. In response to the turmoil, the family established a court and torture chambers to maintain control of the other villagers, giving the town an evil reputation for its harsh conditions. But that doesn't mean life was picture perfect. When Napoleon came into power, his army came into conflict with the locals. Many of them died during the fighting. Already weakened, the population dwindled even more when a series of earthquakes struck the region in the 19th century, forcing many of the villagers to flee. As the castle and the small homes fell into despair, it became too dangerous to live in Balestrino, and authorities evacuated the last inhabitants. Multiple stone churches, a mill, and soap-making buildings are all that remain alongside the nightmarish old castle. As for those who stayed and live in the village below, they only have to look up to see the ghosts of the past. 9. Buran Space Shuttle as Cold War tensions intensified between the United States and the Soviet Union during the 1950s, the two countries competed to develop superior space technology. Known as the Space Race, the period was also marked by competition to be the first country to achieve space-related milestones, like sending a man to the moon. In 1974, the Soviet Union established the Buran program, which sought to develop a reusable spacecraft. It would be a major way to one-up NASA's space shuttle program. The 56-foot-long, 17-meters Buran shuttle was designed to hold six astronauts and had extra room for cargo and satellites. In late 1988, it launched into space after undergoing 24 domestic test flights. The vehicle completed two full orbits before re-entering the atmosphere and touching down successfully under automatic control, making a great accomplishment that NASA had not yet achieved. But the program was cancelled just three years later, in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed. The sole surviving vehicle sits in an abandoned hangar in the former Soviet state of Kazakhstan. Moving it to a museum would have been a complicated and costly task, and there just wasn't enough public interest in the shuttles to justify such an enormous undertaking. But the general consensus seems to have changed. Last year, someone broke into the hangar and spray-painted the shuttle with graffiti, sparking widespread outrage and an ongoing campaign to preserve the spacecraft. 8. The Aguadilla Plane A pilot was moving a passenger plane on the taxiway outside Puerto Rico's Aguadilla Airport in 1992 when the hydraulic system malfunctioned, causing him to lose control of the aircraft. It collided with a parked plane and ended up on fire in a ditch, damaged beyond repair. The aircraft somehow ended up in a large field alongside Route 107. For a while, it was protected by a fence and kept off limits to the public, but the property owner eventually opened the site to curious visitors. Since then, the plane's wings and tail have been removed, and it's become covered in graffiti, both inside and out. There's a staircase leading up to the entrance, but the interior is a lot less sturdy. Little remains of the equipment, leaving the cockpit looking like a gutted-out shell with two steering wheels in it. The pilot and passenger seats have also been removed, and the floors appear to be weak, which explains why visitors are advised to use caution while exploring. Records show that the plane is a Douglas C-54 DDC. It was built in 1943 and could carry up to 60 passengers. Also known as the Skymaster, the aircraft was designed for use by the US military during World War II and the Korean War. During that period, it became immensely popular for both military and civilian use. The C-54 and its civilian counterpart, the DC-4, have been used by more than 30 countries. The last active US military Skymaster was retired in 1974. As of 2020, there were two remaining operational DC-4s serving as historical charter planes in South Africa. 7. UTA Flight 772 UTA Flight 772 was a regularly scheduled passenger flight that traveled from Brazzaville in the Democratic Republic of Congo to Paris, France. It was heading to its destination as usual on September 19, 1989, when a bomb exploded in a luggage compartment, 
causing the plane to rip apart in midair, killing all 170 souls on board. Investigators traced the bomb to Libya, leading them to believe that it was planted as revenge against France for supporting Chad during a recent border dispute with the country. A Parisian court found six Libyan nationals guilty in absentia. They weren't at the trial because their government refused to hand the suspects over to French authorities. The crash was soon forgotten by nearly everyone except for the victim's surviving family members and loved ones, earning it the nickname of the Forgotten Flight. 18 years after the tragedy, they traveled to the crash site with plans to build a memorial and found pieces of the wreck, which had sat undisturbed and untouched by humans for nearly two decades. Volunteers from an organization established by the victims' families and local residents spent the next two months working together to build what was dubbed the world's most remote memorial. They transported stones to the site from 70 miles 113 kilometers away and arranged them in a circle measuring 200 feet 61 meters in diameter. The site is scattered with 170 pieces of broken mirror, one for each crash victim, and one of the plane's wings stands upright in the sand at the circle's edge. Widespread attention was finally drawn to the site in 2013 when someone spotted it on Google Earth. 6. Messerschmitt Bf 109 Throughout World War II, the German Luftwaffe relied primarily on two fighter aircrafts. One of them was the Messerschmitt Bf 109, which had first entered service in 1937 during the Spanish Civil War. The Luftwaffe continued to use it until the end of World War II, and then it went on to serve under the Spanish Air Force until 1965. Several other militaries also used the plane, including the Hungarian Air Force and the Royal Romanian Air Force. During its early years, the Messerschmitt was one of the world's most advanced fighter jets. Nearly 34,000 were built between 1936 and 1945 to keep up with the skyrocketing demand. To this day, it remains the most heavily produced fighter plane in history. But its success came at a cost to the slave laborers at Nazi concentration camps who were forced to build many of the jets. In recent years, a wrecked aircraft sitting upside down on the seafloor near Crete was identified as a Messerschmitt Bf 109. Officials have known about the submerged plane for some time, which rests 89 feet 27 meters beneath the waves. But the wreck managed to evade identification for years, despite Germany's meticulous record-keeping of its wartime aircraft losses. It was ultimately determined that the plane had flown in the Battle of Crete in 1941 when the Nazis invaded the island. It was shot down while attacking Allied forces in the region. The pilot, Oberleutnant Bertolt Jung, survived the crash. The Allies took him as a prisoner of war and relocated him to a POW camp in Australia, where he remained until 1947. Jung returned to Germany after the war, where he worked as an interpreter and joined the post-war Navy. After retiring in 1973, he became the president of a local Red Cross. He died in 1992. 5. Lady Be Good in 1943, a U.S. Army Air Corps USAAC B-24 Liberator nicknamed Lady Be Good vanished along with its crew of nine men while flying over the Mediterranean Sea. It had just participated in a bombing raid of Naples, Italy, and was en route to Libya when it became the only aircraft to disappear in the mission. After an extensive search turned up no signs of the plane or its missing crew members, officials concluded the Lady Be Good most likely plunged into the sea. An oil survey exploration group discovered the wreck in 1958 while working in the Libyan desert. The aircraft was broken in two large pieces, but was otherwise impressively intact thanks to the dry environment. Even at first glance, it was clear that Lady Be Good had crashed into the desert floor. Two years after the wreck's discovery, several crew members' remains were found strewn throughout the area, along with the diary of co-pilot Robert Toner. The journal revealed that the plane had overflown its base and crashed. Eight of the men initially survived and began walking in a desperate attempt to reach safety. They traveled 85 miles, 137 kilometers, in the oppressive, arid heat before five of the crew members gave up. The three remaining survivors continued for as long as they could, but they also eventually became too weak to push on. By then, it was already a miracle that they were still alive, having survived for eight days in an environment where most people only last for two days with the same amount of water the men had. The ninth missing crew member's fate remains a mystery to this day. 
What do you think happened to the ninth missing crew member? Tell us in the comments and hit that subscribe button while you're at it. 4. P4YSA and P4YSB In a scene reminiscent of the TV series Lost, there's a wrecked plane tucked away in the jungle on the Dutch Caribbean island of Curacao. It's clear that the weathered and overgrown twin turboprop aircraft has been at the site for a number of years, but nobody seems to know how it got there. Built by the Japanese Nihon Aircraft Manufacturing Company, it flew under Aruba Airlines as a passenger flight codenamed P4YSA. But there are no records of the events that led to the plane ending up at the remote site, and it's unclear whether it crashed or was towed there. Its wings and twin props have been removed, and at one point, there were reportedly plans to turn the aircraft into a restaurant. But the vision never panned out, leaving the plane neglected and at the mercy of nature. P4YSA was one of two of its particular model that Aruba Airlines purchased in 1986. The other plane, P4YSB, was deliberately sunk as an artificial reef off the coast of Aruba after it was damaged beyond repair during Hurricane Lenny in 1999. It sits roughly 40 feet, 12.2 meters beneath the waves, and has become a popular scuba diving attraction. 3. Bangkok Aircraft Graveyard In 2010, a Thai businessman began buying up old planes and selling their parts for scrap. He parked them on a lot in the Ram Kam Hayang suburb outside Bangkok, where they soon started to rust and became something of an eyesore to the public. Several homeless families have repurposed the disused aircraft into makeshift dwellings. They made the interiors as cozy as possible and have told reporters that it beats living on the street. The unique living arrangement has also given them a chance to earn some much-needed cash. Due to the plane's proximity to people's homes, the site has earned a reputation as one of the world's most unique abandoned places and it's become a popular destination for tourists. The families who live on the property allow visitors to look around in exchange for an entry fee, which is known to range between 100 and 800 baht, 3 to 25 US dollars. While the families aren't particularly bothersome to the property owner or their neighbors, there are some concerning safety hazards that come with living on a dilapidated aircraft. The danger became especially evident last year, when nearby residents noticed smoke spewing from one of the planes, along with a strong chemical odor. Firefighters eventually managed to get the blaze under control and determined that it started in some dry grass, but are unsure of the exact cause. 2. P-40 Curtis Kitty Hawk On June 28, 1942, British Royal Air Force RAF pilot Sergeant Dennis Copping was tasked with flying a damaged P-40 Kitty Hawk fighter plane to a British airfield in Egypt for repairs. But he never reached his destination, and for the next 70 years, the aircraft and pilot's fate remained a mystery. Answers finally came in 2012, when a Polish oil worker stumbled upon the wreck while working in the Sahara Desert. Historians describe the astonishingly intact plane as the aviation equivalent of Tutankhamun's tomb. Its guns and ammo were still on board and most likely hadn't been touched since the day of the crash, leaving it frozen in time. Bullet holes in the aircraft's spine suggest that Copping may have attempted an emergency landing after being shot at. But the P-40 was already damaged before its final fateful flight, and this may have also had something to do with why it crashed. Copping's remains were absent from the scene, indicating that he survived the wreck and tried to reach safety on foot. His remains were found a month after the plane's discovery, roughly 3 miles 4.8 kilometers from the crash site, along with a piece of torn parachute, a metal button dated to 1939, and a keychain bearing the number 61. 1. Boeing 720 For more than 24 years, an abandoned Boeing 720 passenger plane sat near the runway at an airport in Nagpur, India. Its origins were somewhat of a mystery until late last year, when a Twitter user from St. Louis, Missouri named Chris Croy posted a series of viral tweets blaming his father, Kevin Paul Croy, for the aircraft's presence. He explained that the plane had caught the attention of his dad, who's an aircraft mechanic, during the early 90s at the Brownfield Municipal Airport in San Diego. Its owner had allegedly abandoned it for reasons that remain unclear to this day. By then, the aircraft was nearly 30 years old. A retired businessman and plane enthusiast from India named Sam Verma asked Croy if he could get it running again. Croy explained that the plane wasn't commercially viable under US standards, but that it could be used in India. 
he was confident that he could make it fly and get it there. Croy worked to restore the plane's airworthiness, while his mother took care of the necessary paperwork to obtain takeoff permission from the Federal Aviation Administration FAA. Finally, a year later, Croy and Verma boarded the aircraft and flew it to India. The plane reached its destination, but began experiencing engine problems during its first flight in India, forcing its pilots to make an emergency landing at Nagpur. A dispute over payments and dues ensued, according to the younger Croy, preventing any work from being done. In 2015, it was moved to a nearby field, where it remains today. Quartz got in touch with Verma, who confirmed bits and pieces of Chris Croy's version of events. He said that there were no Americans on the plane when it was flown to India, calling the accuracy of Croy's story into question. Verma also clarified that the private company that owned the plane had a disturbing track record of unprofessional conduct and poor maintenance. As a result, the company went broke and abandoned three of its aircraft, including the deserted 720 at Nagpur. Thanks for watching. Which one of these abandoned aircrafts fascinated you most? Tell us in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.